Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Um, I would like to greet our distinguished panelists from Europe and Japan, uh, along with our 100 plus attendees. Thank you for taking your time uh, to be here with us today. And first, uh, I would like to um, say a few words about the EU Japan RISE and ITM mobility projects. Uh, this webinar is to focus on the European Commission Marie Skodoska Curie Actions Initiative and Success Stories and include research and innovation staff exchange and innovative training network projects. Our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, panelists will talk about the projects themselves. And now we are going to uh, invite our first speaker, uh, Przemyslav Jankowski, who is the MSCA Policy Officer in the European Commission. Hello, now you can hear me probably. And um, good morning uh, to the one on the European side and good afternoon to all of you. And thank you for joining this um, webinar. Thank you, Judith, for inviting me. Um, I will start with my presentation. My name is Przemek Jankowski. I work for the European Commission for the Marie Skłodowska Curie Action. And um, uh, I will quickly present you the policy side. You will hear today testimonies from three Marie Skodowska Curie Action projects. Uh, and I will just try to place those projects uh, in the overall policy context uh, so that you can um, imagine why those projects are supported, how they are uh, structured, and uh, what are the objectives from the point of view of the Commission um when it comes to to the support so uh let me maybe go to my slides so first of all uh the commission is supporting uh, many different initiatives uh being this uh, security or agriculture but it's also research and um, uh, the research is supported um through framework programs that takes um, place uh, that um, take seven years the current one from the 2014 to 2020 is called horizon 2020 the next one uh, will be called horizon europe and this is uh, a budget of uh, for for horizon 2020 it's 80 billion euros um, that is divided in certain areas, the so-called three pillars, uh, the excellent science, uh, industrial leadership and societal challenges. And within this excellence science pillar, there is a Marie Skłodowska Curie Action uh, program with uh, 6.1 billion uh, euro dedicated to the program. Uh, now, why the European Commission is doing that is to strengthen the EU scientific and technological basis and the European research area. So all the countries that uh, are together uh, within Europe uh, trying to be more innovative, more competitive when it comes to the overall research uh, landscape. And for the next framework program for Horizon Europe, it is foreseen that 100 billion euro uh, will be dedicated to uh, the research programs. Now, the Marie Skłodowska Curie Action um, has four actions that are dedicated to uh, different topics. As you can see, there is ITN that we will also have some examples today. It's for the doctoral training at the doctoral level. And this is a network of institutions. I will talk about this later. Then we have individual fellowships, which is for postdocs and individual one with organizations uh, also single organization in europe also uh, we have rice that you will hear the testimony today uh, it's about staff exchanges so it's not a long fellowship it are short exchanges uh, that are actually the most popular when it comes uh, to 
uh, Japanese participation, for example. And we have uh, uh, additional action co-fund, which is the regional or national uh, European funding agencies. So for the purpose of today meeting, I will be short. I will just highlight uh, the two of them that uh, will be presented later on so that you can actually have uh, an idea of what is this and how this is structured. Uh, if you will be interested in some details on that, at the end of my presentation, you will see some uh, links to our website uh, that you can collect a little bit more information. So I will talk about ITN, Innovative Training Networks, and I will talk about RISE, Research and Innovation Staff Exchange. But before starting, I would like also to highlight the key features of the Marie Skłodowska key reaction, which for, first of all is mobility of researchers. Uh, being in Japan, uh, moving to Europe, for example, to do uh, research, uh, the mobility element is already there. So all, uh, all our actions are based on this mobility because we believe that physical mobility is uh, a big added value uh, to the research uh, of, of uh, early stage researchers, but also more experienced researchers. Now, we support uh, fellows, we support researchers that are coming from all over the world. We do not have any limitations. So theoretically, it could be that we will support 100% of Japanese researchers in our program. Uh, but obviously, there is a mixture of those. And there is 28% of the researchers in our program that are coming from different countries than the European ones. So it's a quite substantial number. Now, um, it is not only about research, but it's also about the career development. We support a lot, especially in ITN, for example, in this uh, for uh, doctoral candidates, um, career development element uh, in forms of uh, additional trainings on soft skills, for example, uh, how to um, those, those, those could be language courses, that could, those could be um, also some skills like how to, um, how to sell your research to the outside world in the language that, uh, that is understandable, how to write the proposal, how to uh, apply for grants. So skills that can be later on used once uh, you finish your fellowship, you have your PhD and you will go uh, further in uh, your research career. We support also the non-academic sector, so the industrial part of it. And uh, for us, it's very important to bridge this academic and non-academic uh, work. This is quite visible, this collaboration in uh, Japan. However, in Europe, we still lag a little bit behind because this academic work is a little bit let's say, isolated from the industry, from the non-academic world, and we support this bridging. And maybe what is also important, we are bottom-up program. It means that we support all possible uh, research areas, and you will have some examples today also that will show you that all kind of research would be possible to be funded uh, under the Marius Kodowska key reaction. Now, uh, let's go to ITN. Uh, so ITN is a network of uh, institutions. Uh, they are mainly in um, Europe. They are not self-standing doctoral trainings. They are, they are interaction between those organizations. There are usually around eight, nine organizations that are universities, research centers, companies in Europe that are collaborating with each other. And on top of it, there are some partner organizations that can be uh, also uh, in Europe or outside Europe. And uh, all of them, they are collaborating. The partner organization are just hosting researchers for a limited period of time. So basically they are an, an additional uh, element, but they are also interested because they may host uh, researchers actually for free and, um, and also benefit from the research that is done within the consortium, within the network. So here I will not go into details. If you are interested, you will uh, have the slides available after this presentation. However, those are four years projects. We support the fellowship uh, for up to three years. Um, and it's highly competitive, the, the, uh, the program. So if you are thinking about that, please uh, liaise with the European partners and um, 
they will uh, help you to to guide you through through the procedure um, of the of the application. Now uh, they are also um, very competitive and attractive uh, working condition proposed to the fellows within the uh, doc this doctoral training. So basically, it attracts a lot of good talents from all over the world. Now, rise. So the the other action that we will uh, see today. It's about the research and innovation staff exchange. And this is not a long fellowship. Those are short exchanges. The form of um, such a network uh, within research and innovation staff exchange look a little bit like that. There are some European partners. They always need to be at least two. And uh, they may also be third country uh, participants to that. Uh, this is the scheme that is the most popular in Japan. It gives flexibility. It is from one to 12 months fellowship. So short secondments, as you can see. On average, this is around two, three months per fellow. Uh, and it is work on a common research project. You will see example today. So here also some details related to how the program is structured. Um, and uh, what are the requirements? Those are also four years projects. Um, with um, staff exchanges uh, and the staff exchanges as you can see this ER stands for uh, experienced researchers then early stage researchers so at the doctoral level so as you can see uh, there is a representation of, of different let's say um, elements of the staff of, of a company of a university there is also technical staff managerial staff that may be exchanged but uh, as you can see at the lower scope and here we also support um, since the since those people are already employed or have a relation with the employer we support the top up for going uh, somewhere there are also some research costs uh, but again i will not go into details of this implementation here but it's just for you to have an idea what is the support and uh, if you are interested please go um, to the uh, to our website, the Maris Kodowska Kiri website. Uh, if you want to know more details, there is also funding and tender opportunities portal that is uh, provided for all the programs uh, within Horizon 2020. Uh, and also, if you are interested, you can follow us on Facebook, where we have a fellow of a week, for example. So you can actually also see some examples of the project. But OK, I would not like to be very long. I hope that I placed more or less uh, those projects that you will now uh, hear about. Um, and uh, please enjoy the further presentation, because this is really what is this about, about projects, about fellows, about the feedback. And I'm also looking forward to, to hear the testimonies that will follow very soon. So thank you for listening to me. And I give the floor to you, Deep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we go ahead, I would like to launch a very brief poll. If you could please fill this out. Okay, we are going to close the poll in 15 seconds. Thank you so much for your participation. So it seems that most of you know um, bits and pieces about uh, the projects and uh, approximately 13% of you know quite a bit 
and 20% are not very knowledgeable as of yet. Next, I would like to invite the presenters for the BRKO project. Professor Naoko Matsumoto, Dr. Eliano Diana, and Laura Goidorzi. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to um, beam up Eliano on the screen. Hello. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, do you hear me? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. So now, uh, Professor Matsumoto will manage our presentation. In order. Mm -hmm. So please, if you can share your screen with us. Thank you very much. Well, may I start? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, good morning to all our European uh, colleagues and uh, good afternoon to our Japanese colleagues. Thank you very much uh, to be here uh, to listen to us with them about uh, our uh, original experience with uh, this peculiar rice project because uh, BRKO in fact is uh, probably the first time when uh, um, a scientific team tried to do uh, a joint work on field with an archaeological team and uh, we decide uh, please now on the next slide uh, we decided uh, to do uh, this project with uh, a Japanese, uh, some Japanese colleague, because uh, a strong interest on the, about um, Oriental archaeology, and also because the uh, special involvement uh, of the participants. Because in our project, in fact, we have. Uh, different kind of participant, both academic and not academic, and especially the not academic uh, were experienced in uh, Oriental archaeology. And so they pushed uh, the academic participant just uh, to, to try this um, new work, in fact. In this slide, you can see that, uh, in fact, uh, is a, a big project because we have uh, one more than 100 segments, and uh, there are uh, a lot of different uh, specialists involved, more or less in most uh, scientific uh, specialties are involved, uh, chemistry, physics, uh, soil scientists, um, veterinary, um, and uh, biologist, uh, uh, history of art, uh, and so on. Uh, 
And uh, the most important aspect is uh, uh, the transdisciplinarity of the work. What does it mean? Uh, that uh, we are trying to face in the same time, in the same place, a scientific problem. So probably it's the first time that the scientists are doing together with archaeologists their job on the fields. And obviously, when uh, we are able to find some uh, finds, some objects, for example, uh, we keep some little samples from the excavation site uh, just to analyze in our lab. But the most important thing is exactly to do the uh, most important part of our uh, work. Uh, I'm seeing just the excavation site moment uh, all together in order uh, not to lose uh, a lot of information and uh, our project uh, uh, different aspect one is excavation work on field work uh, a lot of uh, laboratory work and obviously we have uh, a lot of activities that are devoted to the both to the education and to the dissemination education in fact uh, is uh, for both for specialists because we have a lot of things to learn from our uh, japanese colleague because archaeology in uh, in far east and in uh, the West are a, have a little bit attitude, have different aspects, and this is very, very important for us to do a sort of comparison about methodologies. And uh, we have also some uh, young researchers, uh, later you can see some work from uh, our um, very good colleague Laura Guidorzi. And so we have also uh, a lot of teaching uh, activities uh, about uh, different methodology and different uh, way to face the same problem. We have also planned uh, two summer schools, one uh, in uh, Europe and one in Japan. But uh, I say later some few words about uh, to manage uh, the summer school because now we are experiencing some uh, problem uh, because of the coronavirus. Now, if you can put the other one, please. Uh, here is the panel, the panel of our project. Uh, we are uh, seven participants, uh, three university, uh, Okayama University, University of Turin, and University of Lisbon, uh, Portugal. Uh, we have a non-profit organization that is in charge with the University of Okayama for the excavation and archaeology um, activity that is IRIA from Italy. And we have also three uh, small uh, uh, enterprises that are uh, three pillars of our project. The art that is devoted to um, uh, archaeometrical uh, scientific analysis of finds. Uh, Terra Marine that is uh, from Greece and specialized on uh, geophysical prospection and the visual dimension from Belgium that is uh, specialized in um, the digital realization of uh, a reconstruction, for example, uh, of objects, and um, her, uh, she will play an important role in the last part of our project that is devoted to uh, the organization of an, an exhibition, a museum exhibition. Now, please, next slide. <clears throat> Okay, now uh, let me talk about the, the benefits and difficulties for the Japanese side of this project. The benefit of the BIQ project for Okayama University as a Japanese partner organi organization is in three aspects. The first benefit is without doubt that it could increase the level of international activities, especially with Europe. The amount of seconded researchers uh, we received in this RISE project is at a level we have never experienced and it is really stimulating. It is also good for increasing international visibility of Okayama University. The second benefit is that we could consolidate the newly founded Center for Research on the Dynamics of Civilizations, which aims at promoting transdiscipli transdisciplinary researches focusing on archaeology and other humanities and social sciences. 
The ARCHEO and the Center for Research on the Dynamics of Civilization started at the same time, and they are mutually beneficial. The center made it easier to find researchers from the graduate schools and the inst institutes who collaborate with European researchers and the BRQ project. And the BRQ activities has become one of the main activities of the center, and that helped the new center to be on track. The third benefit is an academic one. Collaboration and transmission of knowledge and skills are very stimulating. Moreover, Japanese archaeology, especially that of Coffin period, is very poorly known in Europe. The Archaeo project and its final exhibition will be a very good opportunity to transmit knowledge about ancient culture and society in Japan, and that will lead to further collaborations between Europe and Japan in the future. As for difficulties, of course, it is not easy to accommodate such a big number of second men from Europe. Uh, that is about 30 people at the same occasion. We had no such experience prior to this uh, BRCA project, and it surely increased the amount of ad administrative works in addition to research-related works. But as the directors of our university have been very supportive of the project and uh, kindly provided the center with an additional staff who would take care of this BRQ project. So now we are able to cope with this problem. Thank you, Naoko. If you can move to the next slide. And here, uh, probably, is um, I want to, just to show you the, the slide about our kickoff meeting, because uh, the kickoff meeting was also the occasion to do the first workshop. And the workshops are uh, in a very, very important part of our project uh, and also are representative of the um, main benefits for, uh, uh, for example, for the European University. Because uh, this kind of rice project was uh, probably one uh, for us, the first occasion to put together a, a big group of archaeometers. Usually, um, a scientific investigation on archaeology is done uh, from specific disciplines. For example, you can ask a chemist to do some chemical analysis, a physicist uh, to do some uh, radiographic investigation, a uh, soil scientist just to analyze, but separate. And later, it was just um, the work of the archaeologists to put together all this kind of information. For us, it was, in fact, the first time that we were able to realize an archaeometric group uh, from very, very different disciplines. And it was very, very important, for example, for the University of Turin uh, to do it, just to be more competitive and also the, the, a good occasion just to try for example for other um, uh, for ask for other uh, to participate to other european project and the next slide is naoko please please naoko next slide. well uh, here you can uh, see some picture about the group of people that was involved the next slide next one please an uh, important aspect, uh, our uh, project uh, has a very, very good gender balance. Uh, here is a nice picture of all the team of um, scientists and archaeologists uh, all together. And, uh, and I can, it can trust me, it's not so common, uh, both especially for archaeologists and uh, scientists to put together uh, so a uh, huge group of people. The next one, please. The next one. Here is some. This, um, we had also the first symposium when uh, we uh, had the occasion to explain uh, the main topics and the, and the philosophy under our, our idea, our project. And it was very, very important in order to explain exactly to our Japanese partner the means of this peculiar kind of project, because transdisciplinarity, in fact, uh, usually is done from a theoretical point of view. 
but uh, it's very, very rare to do this kind of investigation uh, uh, in an operative way. Next slide, uh, now, please. <clears throat> And here, uh, just uh, very, very few words about uh, our physical work. That uh, in this, this map, um, I sh I'm showing you the where is based our archaeological site. We are excavating in a very, very ancient tomb related to the proto-history of Japan, the Kofun period. The tomb is a, a tumult tomb called the Tobiotsuka Kofun. And next one, please. And here you can see some nice picture about the work of both on the excavation site uh, and both of our scientists that are doing some sampling of objects uh, both on the <coughs> excavation site and, the, and also the first investigation uh, in, the, in the lab. Next one, please. And uh, another very, very important pillar of our project is the building of a database. This is very, very innovative because our goal is just to give the, an open access um, uh, database when uh, we are uh, putting all the information recovered both from the excavation and both from the uh, scientific analysis and uh, according to the European rules. And this is one of the main goals of our project. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, is the core probably of the transdis transdisciplinary approach because all people involved in our project uh, is participating uh, to the building of this very, very hard task. Also because the building of a database is not exactly so simple. And this is the reason why we have uh, uh, so big involvement of uh, digital uh, science uh, uh, specialists. Next one, please, Naoko. We had uh, already some uh, scientific publication. We published in the Journal of Ecological Sciences the, a paper related to the geophysical prospection. And next one, please. And uh, we participated uh, to several uh, conferences. Uh, and we, are, we are trying also to participate to different conferences this year that have been postponed because of the coronavirus. Uh, next one, please, now. Just a quick uh, view to uh, the, our second uh, scheme. We did uh, again uh, more or less the 36% uh, of the segments uh, <clears throat> with uh, the, a balanced distribution. Uh, we have also to consider the difficulty to organize a transfer from Europe to Japan uh, because uh, we have also to match different academic calendar. But uh, I think that we are uh, doing uh, an uh, equilibrate work. Next one, please, now. Uh, and here uh, we can see the more uh, the distribution of the activity. Next one, please. Now uh, devoted to the main event that has been done in the February March of the 2019 in occasion of the first excavation period. Next one, and in occasion of the second uh, uh, workshop. Well, here uh, there are some little. Uh, a report about uh, the benefits for the three um, small and uh, medium enterprises that are doing an important work and then uh, they are also uh, finding some uh, new occasion of work in Japan. And this is very, very important. It also for us is very, very important to compare a different uh, way to face a scientific problem from an enterprise point of view and from an academic point of view. So the collaboration now is very, very fruitful. Next one, please. And uh, we have uh, also a website where you can find uh, several information about all the activities of our project and uh, who will contain also the access in the next future uh, of our uh, database. Next one.
So just a very, very few quick words uh, from uh, Laura. About Hello, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Guidorzi, and I am a chemical and material sciences PhD student at the University of Turin, but I am also an early stage researcher in the BRQ project. So in the first year of the project, I've already spent two secondments at Okayama University, and uh, unfortunately, my third secondment was cancelled <laughs> due to coronavirus, and it was uh, scheduled for March. Uh, Anyway, in these uh, first um, two segments, I was able to be involved in uh, every one of the activities of the project, and uh, in particular in the archaeometric analysis on uh, glass and pottery finds, uh, both from uh, uh, museum collection, but of course also on the uh, first archaeological findings from the Tobiotska Kofun. Uh, also, in uh, several occasions, I was able to, to visit uh, the Tobiotska site during the excavation, so uh, I, I could understand uh, all the different methodologies and uh, uh, approaches uh, from uh, all the archaeologists involved, and of course uh, offer my, my support for the uh, subsequent analysis on the, on the findings. Uh, in general, I can say that uh, this was a great opportunity for me, uh, both from a personal experience, of course, and career development, but also uh, from the research point of view, uh, as I, I was able to, to employ advanced instruments and techniques that uh, I've never used before and uh, that maybe are not available in my university, uh, for example, wavelength dispersion spectrometry, and uh, so uh, I, I hope that uh, I can uh, continue to collaborate with the project also when my PhD program will, uh, will finish and uh, continue to work uh, with this very wide variety of experts. Thank you. Well, just a few words about the COVID-19 impact. In fact, uh, we now are experiencing a stop of the main activity in Japan because we are not allowed to move to the outside of Italy. But uh, how we are uh, managing the situation? In fact, uh, we have um, a good uh, timetable of the, the second man distribution. In fact, uh, we, we left uh, more or less free the last period of our project uh, of uh, second man. And so we can postpone, in fact, a lot of second man months uh, toward the end of the project. And uh, thanks also to our um, organization of our Japanese partner, probably we, are, we can uh, have some flexibility uh, about the uh, main point of our project that are in fact uh, uh, archaeological excavation. So uh, our uh, Japanese partner are able, for example, to postpone probably the second excavation period and it means that uh, we can in fact uh, rearrange the um, second man uh, timetable and uh, in fact uh, one of the pillars of our project are the final exhibition and uh, until now for example we are uh, we have no indication about uh, a delay of this kind of exhibition so we think that uh, if the situation uh, will go better next year probably we can just with an arrangement of the timetable uh, uh, reach the goal of our project without a significant delay. In the meantime, what are we doing? All the in laboratory analysis with the sample that we recovered from the first excavation period and we are doing the hard work in our database realization. That is one of the main pillars, in fact, uh, one of the, my goal of our project. I thank you very uh, I am finished here. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. I thank you also Laura and Professor Matsumoto for the contribution. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much uh, for the presentation. Actually, uh, we have um, one question that uh, you're doubtless um, in position to answer. How was the preparing process of the proposal, what would you suggest to junior academic staff who want to apply next year? About the preparation, the preparation was uh, 
well, uh, very, very delicate uh, and, uh, and also some time consuming because, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this kind of project, uh, considering the transdisciplinary nature, uh, was not to not so easy to explain it to other people in fact because it's half archaeological half scientific and one of the first important aspect was which kind of panel could be the best for the submission scientific of uh, human science. We decided for human science, in fact, because archaeology is the main core of the project. And um, in fact, uh, it required a strict collaboration between uh, archaeologists and scientists. And the preparation uh, for our project was mainly devoted, in fact, not exactly the, the writing of the project, because uh, the, the the archaeological site was very, very clear. The uh, scientific problem was, was very, very clear. But uh, it was not so clear how to explain this new way to do a scientific collaboration. And in fact, uh, uh, we required uh, three submissions, in fact, uh, in order to be successful. Uh, we did uh, a lot of meeting uh, also in Japan. Uh, we had uh, to meeting with Japanese partner in order to refine the writing of the project and to make a, a, a clear writing of what we exactly uh, wanted to do. And Thank I don't know if Naoko uh, has other work to... Uh, yes, uh, it was not easy to, you know, build up the very uh, interesting and plausible projects and we really had a lot of discussions and uh, Eliana and other uh, researchers visited Japan twice to have uh, very heated arguments because uh, Japanese archaeologists didn't know much about what can be done with the uh, uh, European uh, archaeometrists and uh, the European people uh, had very little uh, prior knowledge about Japanese archaeology. So the, about three years of, you know, arguments was very uh, important. And uh, based on that, now we can, you know, uh, carry on our project, I think. Thank you very much. We actually have uh, two more questions, but I'm afraid we have run out of time. So uh, let me assure our audience that basically we are going to answer all the questions in writing and uh, these will be published on the Eurostat Japan portal and on all our SNS. So please be assured that your questions will be answered. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to ask the presenters of the Protein Factory project. Uh, Professor Yamaten Van Dijk, uh, Dr. Kenichi Yoshida, Margarita Bernakavas, and Mine Antelo Varela to present about their multidisciplinary approach focusing on intersectoral cooperation project. Good day. Can you all see me? Yes. And hear me? Yes, I do. Yes. Okay. So it's my pleasure to uh, present uh, an ITN project that we did in the period between January 2015 and December 2018. And uh, it was called Protein Factory. And uh, what you will see is that it was something completely different from the previous project that was uh, presented to you. So the Protein Factory project was a, an ITN project that uh, involved uh, uh, European groups from different European countries. Uh, but uh, we did have an international dimension uh, because we had an advisory board, uh, including Professor Yukida, who's participating in this webinar, and uh, Professor Ross Dolby from the Ohio State University uh, in Columbus, Ohio. So in the project, uh, we had 15 ESRs uh, who did a PhD training uh, research program. And uh, two of them are 
present today in this webinar. Uh, first of all, Margarita Bernal Cabas and uh, Minya Angelo Varela. And uh, both of them will share some of their experiences with you uh, after I've uh, introduced the project. So, as I said, the project is quite different from what you heard in the previous uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and the objective of our project is to make bacteria produce uh, proteins. And these are proteins that are valuable from a pharmaceutical point of view, so they can be beneficial for human health. Uh, or they are enzymes that can be used uh, for the pro production of food or to uh, uh, catalyze uh, uh, industrial processes that are uh, sustainable. So generally, uh, one can say that the use of microorganisms for the production of proteins or small molecules, they add uh, to a, uh, a sustainable uh, uh, industrial process uh, yeah. that uh, costs le less energy and uh, that is uh, generally very green. So the, the basic principle is uh, that we use an, uh, a cell, a bacterial cell, uh, which is depicted in this cartoon. And inside the cell, uh, the bacteria produce proteins. And then these proteins, they can, roughly speaking, go in two directions. They can stay inside the cell, and then they lack a so-called signal for secretion, a signal peptide, or they can be targeted to the outside, and then they're secreted, if all goes well, into the growth medium. Now, from an industrial perspective, this is very uh, interesting, because if the proteins end up in the medium, it's easy to harvest them because you can separate the cells from the growth medium quite easily and at large scale. And you have to think about fermentations of several thousands of liters. Uh, and these uh, cell factories, they produce proteins in the, in the tens of grams per liter range. So you can say, okay, if this is all so great, why do you want to research it? So we, we have uh, decided uh, in consultation with uh, colleagues from the industry that uh, actually uh, for many proteins the production with microorganisms goes quite well but uh, in many cases there are bottlenecks and these bottlenecks can be uh, encountered at uh, many different stages in the process so this can happen at the stage of synthesis where the protein is synthesized at the ribosome and then something goes wrong, it can go wrong at the stage where the protein is targeted to a membrane that encloses uh, the bacterial cell and through which the protein needs to be translocated through a channel. It can go wrong when the protein has to pass the cell wall and at the last stage in the growth medium also many things can go wrong. For instance, the protein can be uh, consumed by the bacteria uh, through degradation. So there are many challenges that need to be faced. We just know it works in principle, but not always. And so what we set up here with Protein Factory was an uh, uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary program where we looked at the microorganisms from two perspectives, the academic perspective, uh, where we wanted to know how does the cell function, and the industrial perspective, how can we make the cell do what we want it to do? And uh, these approaches were fully integrated and they have involved uh, many different disciplines, starting from uh, uh, basic molecular biology to uh, sophisticated biochemistry and the mathematical modeling. So this team that we assembled was highly multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. So I'd like to shift to the next slide, but somehow the presentation is stuck. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we uh, involved uh, in this project uh, 15 uh, Euro European uh, students. Actually, not all of them came from Europe. So, for instance, Margarita, whom you, see, you will see uh, in a few minutes, uh, came from Colombia. But uh, they, they came from different countries and they went to different European countries uh, where they embarked on the PhD research in the protein factory network. All of them were uh, funded for a period of three years to do their PhD research, and I'll come back to that uh, later. So what was great is that uh, uh, right from the beginning, actually, uh, the group uh, developed a very nice team spirit. 
And it was uh, very rewarding to see that uh, people from very different disciplines and both from industry and academia, they really teamed up uh, to achieve the common goal of uh, developing uh, new principles for protein production. And the picture here was uh, recorded at a meeting that was organized by one of the companies, uh, Novozymes, uh, at the Danish Technical University in uh, Copenhagen. So um, the team that we assembled was uh, uh, from two different sectors, the academia and the industry. On top uh, in the panel, you see the academic partners, so the University Medical Center Groningen, which is uh, my home university, uh, was coordinating the project. And then we had uh, uh, members from the University of Kent in the UK, uh, from, from the INRA in uh, Julien Josas in France, Stockholm University, uh, the Humboldt University in Berlin, and the Ernst Arndt University in Greifswald. And our uh, industrial uh, counterparts were from uh, uh, Denmark, so Novozymes in uh, Copenhagen, uh, DSM Food Specialties in the Netherlands, UCB Celtech uh, in Slough in the UK, and we had two small, medium-sized enterprises involved, Abel Biosciences in Stockholm, and FGen uh, in Switzerland. So, and I can only say that uh, it worked beautifully. It was a great team. Everybody uh, contributed uh, very uh, nicely. And uh, also these uh, partners uh, hosted uh, secondments of the students. So uh, students uh, who were doing their PhD in academia would go <coughs> to uh, industrial partners and uh, the other way around. And, uh, all the partners uh, contributed uh, to the training program. So we had uh, training at uh, different levels. Of course, most of the training uh, was given at the home universities, but uh, twice per year we had uh, network-wide uh, training events. And these uh, involved uh, both lectures and uh, uh, practicals. So in this case, uh, you see some images of a practical that was given at the University uh, of Greifswald. And uh, uh, it involved uh, laboratory uh, work and uh, lectures on uh, the analysis of uh, bacterial proteomes, which are the assemblies of all the proteins in a bacterial cell. So we also uh, met uh, twice a year and during these uh, meetings we uh, took care of uh, training, so not only uh, um, training on the topic of the research, but also uh, on uh, more soft skills uh, and uh, presentation skills. And we organized uh, two big meetings, uh, international meetings, in the context of a, a seminars or conference program called uh, Recombinant Protein Production. So the, the first one that uh, the protein factory participants uh, were involved in was uh, the uh, uh, RPP9 meeting in Dubrovnik, uh, Croatia. And it involved about uh, 200 participants. And then we had a second one. Oh. Did it again. Yeah, a second one. Uh, which was organized in uh, 2019 on Crete. And again, there were about uh, 200 participants in this meeting, slightly more than that. Um, what was nice about these meetings is that, uh, first of all, they gave us a platform to uh, showcase uh, what we've been doing to the uh, international uh, community, especially, of course, those who are interested in the topic. Uh, but also, um, it allowed uh, networking events. So uh, during that meeting, or during both meetings, we teamed up with uh, other programs uh, uh, that uh, did uh, PhD training. So uh, there was a Biotop program from the uh, Boku University in Vienna. There was a local uh, network, but also the ECHO systems uh, network uh, uh, that was involved uh, and still operational uh, at the time of the Croatia meeting participated and we had a, a big morning session with uh, joint seminars. So this allowed uh, networking between the ESRs and uh, gave them a possibility to see uh, how other networks work and how other 
students can interact. And uh, all these programs involve students from all over Europe. Um, another nice thing about these international conferences was that the ESRs were involved in the organization, so they became familiar with uh, all the, let's say, the stresses and the challenges that uh, are involved in, in organizing uh, an international conference. And uh, it was exhausting, but uh, actually everybody thought it was super uh, rewarding. So then, uh, uh, of course, we did uh, various outreach activities. And if you're interested in uh, more details, you can visit uh, the website uh, of the program. Um, so this involved uh, talking to people in the uh, uh, community and uh, politicians. So altogether, this program uh, worked uh, very well. It ended uh, almost two years ago. But what we can conclude is that uh, it uh, delivered uh, uh, a better understanding of the principles uh, that uh, underlie protein production in bacteria. We identified and, and resolved to some extent several serious uh, production bottlenecks. Um, we have a better understanding of uh, stress. And uh, you may think that only human beings uh, suffer from stress. But uh, believe me, bacteria can also suffer from stress, especially if you uh, try to make them do something that they don't uh, naturally do. And uh, these stresses are very uh, counterproductive. So the same that applies for humans uh, actually applies also for <laughs> microorganisms. So we have uh, delivered a toolbox of uh, expression systems. We have some interesting mathematical models that uh, tell us how bacteria manage their resources in terms of nutrients and how we can uh, uh, take that into account in uh, protein production. And we developed some strains that can be used in practice. But uh, I think the most important uh, output uh, of this program is that uh, um, actually the 15 ESRs that were uh, working on the program, they, they have become really highly qualified researchers. So they have experienced the whole process of uh, doing uh, research. Uh, they they learn to do the, the laboratory work, of course, but they also uh, learn how to interact uh, at an academic level and, and not only in an academic context, but also uh, in the industrial context. So we believe that that has prepared them well for um, the real life after the PhD. But uh, maybe they can comment on that uh, themselves. So having said that, I'd like to uh, give the word to uh, Margarita Benal Cabas, who will uh, introduce you uh, to some of the aspects of the PhD training. Margarita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan Martin. So good morning. As I mentioned, as Jan Martin mentioned before, uh, I'm from Colombia. So originally I was doing my master's in Canada and then I came here to my PhD. I'm, I'm currently in the last stretch. And uh, participating in Protein Factory was an amazing opportunity. And I I'm glad to say that we're still part of the network, even though uh, the project finished two years ago. So Protein Factory was a very interdisciplinary program. Uh, we were able to meet top experts in multiple fields. So I'm a molecular bacteriologist, but I was able to meet bioinformaticians and statisticians and uh, biochemists. So I learned a lot uh, during the program. Uh, we were also able to work with industry. I had never worked with industry before, and it was uh, really nice to be able to understand and see what they really think and what they really want. So the expectations shifted uh, once you started working with industry. And also we were able to do a lot more than just, uh, you know, if we had stayed in our host university. One of the pitfalls of the program is that uh, even though it's three years long, as you've seen, there's a lot of training involved. So the, tight line, uh, the timeline is very tight, which means that there's not that much room for a uh, failure or mistakes, so there's a lot of pressure. And uh, this can in turn affect the scientific output because people have to finish their thesis in most countries within the three years, so it's uh, quite tight. Uh, it was really nice to be able to be part of this really highly competitive program. Uh, there was a lot of mobility involved. We went to workshops in multiple countries around Europe and multiple host uh, institutions. 
I was able to do some research in Germany. I went to University of Breisfeld for three months where I worked on mass spectrometry. I didn't know anything about mass spectrometry, but I also learned a lot. I was able to access and learn novel techniques. And uh, so that was uh, something that was also very nice. And uh, the last thing was that uh, we participated in a very nice community where we were able to speak uh, freely and just exchange a lot of ideas. So it was a very dynamic process. Uh, I'll give the word to Minya now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Minya. Uh, actually, I am Spanish, but I have studied in Portugal, and my host institution was the University of Greifswald. And as Margarita said, actually, it's nice that both of us are here together because we interchange between University of Greifswald and Groningen. So Margarita was in Greifswald for three months, and I was in Groningen for two months, also learning cloning techniques. So actually, I think one of the best experiences of this protein factory is this secondment. And unfortunately, this COVID crisis has been hampering a bit this kind of mobility, but maybe there are some ways to overcome this uh, kind of problem by maybe giving a special status to the researchers. So as our colleague just said, her secondment was cancelled, which is actually not the point of this uh, Marie Curie. But anyway, I would like to talk about our experience. And as Margarita said, and Ian Martin, one of the most important points is the um, networking. And during this ITN, we had great collaborations among all the partners. And in fact, as Ian Martin said, the project has finished two years ago and the collaborations are still ongoing. So Margarita just published a paper now from a collaboration we have done and she's still working on the second one which is also from this collaboration that she has done in Kreiswald and um, yeah also organizing the RPP9 was an amazing experience very stressful as Jan Martin said but it was also a great opportunity for us to listen from Kenichi Professor Kenichi, which is here with us, and Professor Ross Dalby about the experiences of working both in Japan and the United States. So this is really helpful for us future researchers and early stage researchers on what we want to do with the future. And if you want to go to Japan or the United States, then we had a really clear idea of what this would entail. So it was like a very, very good experience. Um, yeah, and also, addressing the COVID-19 uh, crisis, which of course is going to affect all of us researchers. As I said, maybe the researchers, so the EU could offer some kind of extension. So I know, for instance, FCT is offering this kind of extension to the researchers so for six months or, or, or something, or maybe a special passport or contact tracing would also be helpful in this kind of uh, cases. And also looking at the future, I think this is an opportunity for the resurgence of the European spirit and also a cohesion between researchers and also shows how important science is during this time of crisis. Yeah, and this Thank is very much, what Mia. I to... Thank you. <laughs> then I would like to give the word to my friend, uh, Professor Kenichi Yoshida from the University of Kobe. Yeah, thanks, Ian Martin. And uh, uh, dear audience, uh, I'm uh, pretty much happy uh, to be here to give you some words about the function of International uh, Advisory Board uh, for the uh, programs uh, supported by uh, Marie Curie program. And uh, it's been already told. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me, right? Yes, good. And uh, 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 as it's been told, um, this uh, protein factory program uh, has the uh, active international advisory board function. And me, myself uh, from Japan, and also another colleague from US, Ross uh, Dalby, uh, we functioned as uh, the advisory board members. And we did the uh, scientific and technical advices and also our information of career path and the support for the uh, future course of all those uh, early stage researchers. And actually, uh, the first time we enjoyed the involvement actually, uh, uh, proactively in uh, uh, the Croatia meeting, it was held three years ago, 
as already mentioned, uh, held in Dubrovnik in Croatia. And uh, it was, if I remember, almost one day and a half program to listen to all the presentations by the young researchers. And also we had a round table about how they can uh, involve, uh, cultivate uh, new uh, possibility in the near future. And uh, Ross and myself made a presentation about how they can get uh, positions in Japan or US. And uh, so um, actually uh, we need a second generation who can uh, conduct the, uh, this kind of research further. And these uh, are participants of the program of 15 students or RSA researchers can be a very good candidate who can take an over of the, what we did in long time years. And like uh, this uh, our program is helping a lot for the society or for the next generation. So this is one of the point I like to mention. And of course, so uh, Margarita and uh, Minia, you enjoyed the contribution of the two guys of the Advice Board, didn't you, right? <laughs> yes. uh, uh, actually, it was mentioned already, uh, this is not the end of the game. Uh, so we already have uh, some extension of the second stage of this kind of uh, international collaboration and probably Yamata will mention about in a few seconds. And uh, so all these uh, Japanese colleagues and US colleagues or Chinese colleagues, but whoever, actually, even though you are not involved in directly the program, but you can contribute this kind of activity like advocacy board or just uh, voluntarily you can be involved. So this is also very, very valuable for us and for the societies. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Kenny. So Thank you very much. Wrap up. So this uh, project uh, uh, was uh, really uh, very enjoyable. It was uh, successful in terms of uh, the research program and the training of the researchers. And uh, if you ask me, would you do it again? Uh, coordinate such a project? Uh, that the answer is a full yes. And in fact, uh, as uh, Kenichi already hinted, uh, we have another. Uh, ITN project going that started uh, a year ago is called Secretors and again it involves uh, uh, European uh, groups from different countries and different sectors and it's called Secretors. Um, I think these projects are very valuable so they make uh, the participants I would say better Europeans uh, because uh, you get to know each other very well and you talk about uh, the lot, a lot of the things that are going on in the different countries not only in uh, science, but also in society. And it gives you a better appreciation of uh, the challenges that uh, are faced uh, in different uh, countries uh, within Europe. And through this uh, window of the, to the world that we created uh, by the uh, advisory board, we also have a better uh, view, and especially the uh, ESRs get a better view of what's uh, going on on a global scale. So I think uh, these projects are super valuable. Uh, for secretors, uh, we're of course now facing a situation with COVID-19 that uh, many meetings and training programs have been had to be cancelled. Uh, they have been replaced by uh, online activities, uh, but they do not completely uh, uh, co yeah, compensate for the loss of the uh, uh, social uh, networking that is otherwise taking place in these programs. So that's all I would like to say. If you have any questions about uh, Marie Curie ITN projects like we uh, performed uh, and presented here, um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great Thank presentation. Uh, I would like to relay only one question from our audience. Uh, how long time they actually spent to prepare the proposal? So how long did it take for you to prepare the proposal altogether? It takes forever. Um, <laughs> uh, it's not true. But uh, so we, I mean, our uh, proposal preparation, uh, I mean, the first stage, uh, identifying the partnership, identifying the objectives, that, that is a question, a matter of months, I would say. And, and uh, you uh, recruit partners or uh, industrial uh, partners from your network. Uh, and then it comes to uh, submitting the proposal and uh, the evaluation. And so our proposals uh, uh, often get a high rating, but it's, it's a very competitive uh, 
scheme. And so we had uh, for protein factory, uh, we were successful in the third attempt. And that's why I said forever. So uh, you have to be very persistent. Uh, and uh, especially if you're close to the cutoff value and, and just beneath it, uh, my recommendation would be don't give up, uh, try again. Uh, try to see how you can make uh, the proposal better, more uh, attractive uh, to potential reviews and, and just don't give up. So, but it can be a lengthy process. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, again, I apologize to the audience that we cannot devote more time to questions, but I will make sure that everything is sent to our presenters and uh, they will doubtless answer all the queries and then send their replies, which I will in turn upload on our website. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to ask the presenters of Terra Apps, uh, of the Terra Apps project, uh, Professor Richard Hogg, Professor Dr. Osamu Kojima and uh, Michele Chito to give their presentation. Hi there. Hello there, everybody. Can everybody see okay? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm Richard Hogg from uh, Glasgow, uh, representing uh, Terra Apps, along with uh, Michaela and Osamu here on, uh, on their webcams too. So good evening. Good evening. Um, just... Okay, so I'll very briefly introduce what Terra Apps is about and then who is involved. Uh, focus really on my view on the role of the Japanese partners that we have uh, and then I'll hand over in turn to Professor Kojima to tell uh, for him to tell a little bit of his story and for Michele to tell a little bit of his story uh, and then I'll mention briefly because we have to mention COVID I'll mention briefly COVID uh, before summarizing okay so TerraApps is an ITN which you've heard about and we are working on uh, terahertz technologies for imaging uh, radar and comms uh, we too have 15 uh, early stage researchers who are still in for their PhDs, as well as being employees of uh, universities around around the park. Uh, we're concentrating on one particular technology. I'm not really, uh, I think I've only got a slide just to briefly touch on the area that we're working in. These are in um, uh, if you like, the, 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 the intersect between uh, photonics and electronics. Uh, it's a four year program, we're a couple of years in. Uh, there are 10 academic and 14 uh, partner organizations which I'll come to in a moment. So this is the only technology I think uh, we talk about. So we uh, highlighted a need for uh, within uh, Europe for, the, for early stage researchers who were trained in a particular area, a multidisciplinary area that kind of bridges electronics and photonics. Uh, there's a well-known, in our field anyway, terahertz gap where we don't really have good uh, devices that emit light in this region um, and the prediction is that these these components will be uh, part of 5G, 6G, 7G uh, and will be part of the sensors uh, and imaging systems that make up the Internet of Things not only helping to drive the Internet of Things. Uh, so that was the, the drive for defining the project. Um, we have a map here of the participants and a list down the side. I'll not go through them all. You can see that we, we, we cover uh, much of Europe. Uh, the project is, is coordinated by my colleague, uh, Professor Edward Wasigi uh, at the University of Glasgow, uh, who, who led the submission. Uh, and he, with his network, he drew together a number of researchers uh, from around Europe, as you see. Um, Worldwide, our partners are shown here, and I guess significantly we have uh, four partners um, from Japan, uh, some from the US uh, and others, uh, so other uh, companies um, and uh, institutes within Europe, but four from Japan, and those are listed here, and I'll, I'll talk about those in turn in a couple of slides. Um, one thing I have learned, so the great thing about interaction and discussion is I've realized uh, we really should get a Terra Apps t-shirt uh, like a protein factory had, I think that that would be a, a move forward for us. Uh, but here are 
Uh, ESRs, uh, if you count them up, you'll see there are 14. Of course, there's one taking the photo. Um, but all, all of these uh, very bright young things are from all around the world. Okay, so uh, what do our partners from Japan bring? Well, um, they're included uh, not for uh, being in Japan, but for being excellent, I would say. Uh, so here's a list of, of four of the uh, current members. So there's Tokyo Institute of Technology, uh, Professor Asada brings a lot of uh, a long history of the type of device that we're working on. Uh, Tokyo Metropolitan University also works on those kinds of devices and specializes in RF electronics. Uh, Osaka University, so Professor Nagatsuma, his lab, uh, again, have a long history of working on terrorist devices and systems and applications. Uh, University of Kobe, where Professor Kojima is from, uh, he works on terrorist source and optical characterization. Uh, and we're also looking at maybe increasing uh, the membership to another partner. Uh, Rome Semiconductors are a, a, a large uh, opt uh, electronic and optical component manufacturer in Kyoto, uh, and they are uh, currently uh, attempting to commercialize the manufacture of these, this new type of device. So all of these people really are uh, bringing critical expertise, capability uh, that, we, that we want to exploit. Um, so now looking at why, why we think this is important, well, um, I think first of all we've highlighted the access to skills, capability, resources, which is critical for research and training. Uh, another key element that we're, we're well aware of is uh, that of career development. So uh, myself and Mikhail Faginov, who's at Vienna, who's one of our uh, uh, investigators, uh, we both spent uh, significant times uh, as, uh, as researchers in Japanese companies and in, uh, in universities. We brought our networks to Terra Apps when it was being formed. Um, and in fact, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an EU Japan fellow from 1987 or 8. No, 1997 or 8. I'm not that old yet. But I'm an EU Japan fellow from that era. Uh, which maybe, I don't know if it predates uh, Marie Curie or not, uh, maybe not the real Marie Curie, but I'm sure, but uh, maybe the programs, I don't know. But the key element here is that we know that it's important for uh, early stage researchers to be able to develop uh, their own network, uh, get used to working with remote collaboration, which we're all doing much more now, of course, uh, and gaining different perspectives on uh, research approach, direction, possible applications and so on that working in a, a non-native lab really brings. So we're all, I guess, uh, very strong advocates of, of mobility. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Professor Kojima and, hope, and I'll still be in charge of the, uh, the buttons to move the slides. So I hope things work okay, but I'll hand over now to Professor Kojima to uh, chat about his background and uh, comments. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Osam Kojima from Kobe University. Uh, I joined this project as a partner in last summer. In my part, I talk about the story how I joined the TerraApps team. Firstly, I tell you how I met Professor Hogg beyond this long distance. Uh, my research area is a spectroscopy. Uh, this is a method to investigate the optical properties of materials using light. In particular, I have been working for the ultra fast spectroscopy using ultra short pulse laser to clarify and control the carrier dynamics in the nanostructured semiconductors. Yeah, next, please. Uh, next, I tell you the history of our collaboration. Uh, I met Professor Hogg in 2006 at Kobe University. So this was the first time. He joined the International Symposium held at Kobe University as an invited speaker. In 2012, I obtained the budget to stay in UK and I joined his group in University of Sheffield as a visiting researcher. In his group, I came up with uh, 
I came up with and started the research for terahertz wave emitter. In 2017 and 2019, I stayed in Glasgow by uh, Kakenhi, and last year he visited Kobe for 60 days by the JSPS program. Furthermore, except for this, Professor Hogg came to Japan and I visited the UK many times. During this period, I had shown him our facility of the spectroscopy and discussed the obtained results. Then last year, I could join uh, TerraApps by his recommendation. And Michele's visit for his measurement in Kobe was realized. Yeah, next, please. Uh, uh, this collaboration gave me much benefit. Uh, we believe the combination of the semiconductor technology in Glasgow and the spectroscopy in Kobe can open the new terahertz technology, like the portable gas spectrometer. Yeah, next, please. Uh, Moreover, TerraPS has allowed me to initiate a collaboration with the various research groups in Europe and Japan. For my group, particularly for students, this collaboration gives the opportunities of practice of the real scientific English and experience of the different cultures. I hope this research labor brings mutual involvement in projects for students in another lab. Furthermore, I also strongly hope my many European researchers and PhD students come to Kobe to access our unique expertise and capability. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so over to Michaela now. Hello everyone, I'm Michele, I'm an electronic engineer from Italy and early stage researcher one for TerraPS and I'm based in uh, University of Glasgow under the supervision of Professor Richard Hogg. Um, I'm working on resonant tunneling diodes from the point of view of the epitaxial design, the manufacture and the characterization as, as cited before by Professor Richard and Kujima, we are working on terahertz sources. I was lucky to be in Kobe between November and December, so before the lockdown crisis. And during my second month, Kojima provided me capability and experience uh, not available in Glasgow or in other TerraPs partner organization across Europe. I was there not only to use these capabilities, but also to learn a new optical characterization techniques from which I collected useful data for my research activity. Uh, and at the end of my stay, I had the opportunity to share my results with the local research group in uh, several group meetings with session of question and answer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in Kobe was also my first time in Japan and I had the opportunity to extend my personal network of contacts in a more international uh, regime. And of course, I experienced the Japanese culture in terms of food, tradition, I visited the shrine, temples and city. So the overall experience had a great impact on my personal development, uh, not only scientific, and for which, uh, in conclusion, I'd like to thank uh, my supervisors and the entire TerraPs program and the Marie Curie consortium. So thanks again for this opportunity. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so I guess uh, there was a brief to mention COVID. I guess what the lockdown that we've been uh, experiencing has taught us is that li the, our liberty and mobility are precious um, and I think for uh, us within uh, TerraApps who are halfway through and we've so far had two uh, ESRs making uh, visits to uh, uh, to Japan for, for training um, but uh, we'll just have to take our opportunities when we have them so we don't know you know there's so much uncertainty I think that's all we can say that we'll 
take down other opportunities now. Um, I think one of the benefits of this kind of uh, network building and then that forming future collaborations that work over uh, eight or nine time zones is that we become very good at uh, remote collaboration, which actually we're all doing now as a consequence of COVID. Uh, we're all becoming experts at this forum and other ones so that we can work from our uh, home offices or spare rooms or kitchen tables. Uh, so uh, I've hopefully summarized what Terra Apps is about and what, uh, and what I, you, the EU Japan links are. Uh, I've provided my perspective, and Professor Kojima and, and Michele have provided uh, their perspectives. And I guess we're, we're, we're open to questions now from anyone who has anything to ask. Thank you so much. Uh, we actually have a very brief question. Uh, what advice, uh, what suggestion would you give to junior academic staff who would like to apply in the future? Um, I would say that the, uh, I, I think that the uh, fellowships that, so, so the, uh, the, the fellowships that say uh, uh, Michele have are really excellent. I would, and I recommended to people within our master's courses who are thinking of moving into research to apply for, to look for ITM, uh, ITM positions primarily. So I think they are uh, excellent, they, they are an excellent training uh, tool. Um, and actually, I, I would just recommend find the relevant websites, which I'm sure the, 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 that'll be here, find the relevant websites and apply for a, a PhD studentship uh, like the one Michele and our other ESRs, have, uh, I think they are uh, uh, well excellent. Um, I guess beyond that, um, I guess it's it, it, you know that these networks really do help. So if you happen to be a PhD student now, thinking about your postdoc or something similar in Japan, utilize the network of people in your group, people in your department or school. Um, to be able to make those links, I think if you, you know, if you mention you have an interest, say, in moving from Japan to Europe or Europe to Japan, to do some postdoctoral work, um, that the ability of you know someone who may be able to say, oh, you know, I, I know Professor X, maybe drop him an email or her an email and see how you get on. So I think making use of the networks is really critical too. Thank you very much. Um... We appreciate the interesting presentation. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, I would like to give the floor uh, with the closing remarks to uh, Perik Fion Ashida. Apologies, one second, it's a bit of a technical glitch. Hello. Hello, I think that the uh, uh, connection is correct now. Is, that, is, it, is it the case, uh, Judith? Yes, I think so. Okay, good uh, evening in Japan and uh, good morning to the European colleagues. I will be very brief. My name is uh, Pierrick Fillon Ashida. I work at uh, the headquarter of DG Research in charge of the relations with Japan on science and technology. Uh, you will have the slides uh, available from uh, the web, so I will just go through three points. Uh, but first of all, uh, let me say thank you for all the Japanese colleagues and the Europeans who have discussed, I was listening. It's very good that uh, we colleagues from administrations listen to PIs, listen to the reality on the ground. Uh, I have basically three messages today. It's the first time that we ever organize a very uh, focused uh, webinar. We will have to do it 
uh, obviously with the COVID situation, uh, we need to know how to do pro possibly another webinar, uh, maybe by end of June, but most likely because there is a summer period still with COVID uh, uh, in July and August. I will say that let us by September. So uh, we will interact with the EU delegation, uh, Dr. Uh, Gereminas, who unfortunately could not join today, and the colleagues uh, like uh, Mr. Jankowski, who spoke in order to find out if we should have a second webinar, maybe oriented, uh, if you could show the slide, my first slide. Uh, Yes, if either we do something by end of June or as I said, by September on a webinar oriented by specific scientific areas and we take the success stories exactly like today. We take whatever uh, uh, Marie Curie, uh, Sklodowska Curie uh, schemes we have or, or also projects in a specific domain, for example, on mm -hmm. nanotechnologies, on energy, or if we do a second webinar more focused by the type of funding mechanism. We discussed today uh, some RISE, some ITN initiatives. So if we continue on that way. So this is uh, the, the first message. Uh, what is next? But uh, uh, Judith, who is a Your Access uh, Japan representative, will look at it. My second message is, I feel uh, as, a, as a working for an ad, ad, ad administration, uh, it's very important to bring the people on the ground. So all of you in Europe and in Japan, that's why today the idea was from start to do it really on a team base to show that uh, Europeans work with Japanese. Uh, but we need to share a little bit more the experience. Uh, I could hear extremely positive feedback, but sometimes also difficulties. We have to list up these kind of issues. Uh, we also need to see uh, something which uh, uh, is indicated at the bottom of the slide. Uh, by the end of the year, the EU will have uh, adopted the Euro Horizon Europe uh, program. On the Japanese side, there are several initiatives. One of them is Moonshot. Uh, so the Moonshot is, is uh, uh, an opportunity maybe to expand uh, links via Marie Curie Skodowska Curie scheme or via projects. Uh, just for the global information, in fact, next week, the Minister Takemoto from Cabinet Office will sign with the EU Commissioner a specific uh, letter of intent to bring closer the European program with the Japanese initiatives. So this is my, my second uh, comment. The, the last thing, um, is uh, via the work of Judith as a Euraccess uh, Japan desk. Uh, she will uh, look at a questionnaire. She will develop a questionnaire. We will also welcome the support of the EU delegation whom I mentioned. Uh, and we will see uh, how we can bring not only PIs as we did today, but also institutions. Uh, you are working institutions and for administration it's quite relevant to make the advertising at the level of institutions, so globally, universities, research labs. Um, my last message is what will be the impact of COVID uh, on mobility, how we have to reinvent ourselves uh, in front of this uh, situation, how in fact mobility can happen without having people mobile. Uh, so this, it's a paradox but probably we should take it as an opportunity. In conclusion, thank you very much to Judith first uh, to organize all of this, and thank you to all the colleagues who have spoken. Uh, all this is going to be recorded material, uh, but it's a great uh, way uh, to expand the, the group, and I hope to see you another time. Thank you, arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all the presenters and all our audience for today's participation. 
And I would like to reiterate um, the intention to actually answer all questions and they will be uploaded on the website. So please rest assured that you will not um, be left out. All the chats and the questions will be answered. Also, the recording of the webinar will be uploaded on our website. So please download or simply view on our platform on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, as your time allows. Thank you again for participating and we'd like to welcome you in our upcoming webinars as well. After the webinar, you're going to have a survey. It takes only one minute to fill it out. Uh, we would be most grateful for your feedback. Thank you very much. Goodbye.